Last time we developed an expression which told us what the acceleration due to gravity was of a plate which extended to plus and minus infinity in all directions. That plate has a thickness t and that could be the oh, the elevation of your station above uh, your reference datum which could be sea level and that gave us this term in the expression for the theoretical gravity. And next <clears throat> we want to take a look at the expression in the, t in the calculation of the theoretical gravity that well we, we, we uh, have valleys, we have mountains, uh, what are their effect on the spring extension? And think about that for a moment. Uh, you have a mountain here, uh, it is mass which is above the gravimeter, so it's going to pull the spring up, reduce the extension of the spring, reduce the measured acceleration due to gravity. <clears throat> the valleys are a deficit of mass, or mass that is not actually present in that infinite plate. So when we remove it, that also reduces the spring extension and uh, decreases the observed acceleration due to gravity over this area. And so that's why we have a negative sign here in the topographic term. <clears throat> and those two terms go together. We have the uh, expression for the, for the plate, and then we have to introduce the expression for the topography. The way the topography is usually accounted for is using this uh, ring formula, and we'll talk about that in a minute. <clears throat> this is from um, this diagram here is from Berger, Sheehan, and Jones. Uh, we we have the expression for the acceleration due to gravity of a ring. We divide the ring up into so many sectors, and then we throw the topography into these sectors estimate the average elevation in, of a topographic feature in an individual sector and then calculate its influence that way. <clears throat> so that's um, generally what we do and we'll, let's, let's kind of come back and think about where this, this expression comes from for the ring. Um, <clears throat> We, when, if you go back to our development of the acceleration due to gravity over a disk or a vertical cylinder, we assumed that the inner radius was zero. And we obtained this uh, definite uh, integral, which evaluated gives us, uh, we just had an outer radius and inner radius of zero. And we ended up with one over, uh, <clears throat> one over z, the uh, thickness of the, um, of the, uh, cylinder minus 1 over r0 squared plus e squared to the 1 half power. So if instead we carry out uh, an integration from with an inner radius of r sub i, then we're, we have this definite integral that we're evaluating at r0 and r sub i. Given the minus sign here, that kind of reverses the terms. So we get 1 over the inner radius squared plus e squared to the 1 half power minus 1 over the outer radius plus e squared to the 1 half power. So taking, uh, taking that result, I just repeated it here. This is basically this integral we talked about. And instead of integrating uh, from h1 to h2 as we did before, we're going to integrate from 0 to z, the thickness of the ring. <clears throat> so we're assuming that we're kind of standing on top of the ring, uh, the center of the ring. And we're evaluating this integral from 0 to z. Remember, this was a two-step process uh, before we had an additional integration to perform where we were integrating from h1 to h2. Now we're going from 0 to z of this expression. And this should be something you might try out, uh, see if you get uh, this expression for the acceleration due to gravity over the ring. Uh, which you find in most, most texts. 2 pi g rho r0 minus r outer, the in, outer radius minus the inner radius, the inner radius squared plus z squared to the 1 half power minus the outer radius squared plus z squared to the 1 half power. 
So, <clears throat> now we have the acceleration due to gravity produced um, by this ring-like feature. In order to get the acceleration due to gravity of a particular subdivision of this ring, we just divide the ring by however many sectors we have in the ring. So, if we have eight sectors, then we take one-eighth of the acceleration here. <clears throat> So again, the topographic correction is, or the topographic effect, uh, depending on, you know, right now we've been concentrating on effects. That's made by fitting the topographic features into each sector. So it'll be something like this. Here's our topographic feature. I've moved the station over here. We've got a mountain. Uh, we've got some hills out here at a distance from our observation point. We center the ring at our observation point. We have a sector which sits over this topographic feature, and we're kind of looking down on the topography here. We've got two knolls, kind of a crude uh, representation of the contour lines in this uh, uh, sector, two, two little hills. And uh, we would estimate what the average elevation of this topography is inside the sector and then we would calculate g for the sector using a z which would be equal to that average elevation the average elevation in this uh, in this sector so <clears throat> in practice uh, we would have several rings around a particular observation point and generally they go from A through M and each ring is divided up into you know the F ring that I've shown here goes from 1280 feet to 2936 feet and it's divided up into eight sectors the average elevation in each sector is estimated and its contribution to the acceleration at the observation point is computed so we're going to take a few minutes and just kind of look at how one would go about this process. But first, uh, <clears throat> you know, thinking about trying to figure out what the average elevation here is could be kind of a difficult, you could eyeball it, or you can do as some people have done in these sectors where the topography can be, often is quite complex. You can form a mental average or uh, use some paper and pencil to take the elevation at several points within an individual sector and come up with an average that way. <clears throat> so coming up with the average can be a, a guess or it can be done a little bit more uh, rigorously by, by looking at the elevations at several points and taking an average. Uh, it's worth noting that nowadays with uh, digital elevation data available over just about any place on earth. Uh, these topographic, these terrain corrections can be made using computer algorithms which uh, uh, use the data in the, uh, di the digital, digital elevation data in order to come up with a more precise uh, calculation of the effects within individual sectors or could do it even pixel by pixel with that is computationally intensive, so you probably do some averaging and, uh, as you get out to some of these outer rings or uh, further, further and further away. Uh, the end ring, you know, how far out you go depends on how rugged the how you know what what topography you're dealing with at a distance. And if you were in the Himalayas, um, your station was. Um, you know, within about 14 miles of Mount Everest or some other large topographic feature, you might want to compute out to the end ring, which goes from about 14 to 21 miles or 22 to 33 kilometers. So that's just kind of the practical side of, uh, of uh, calculating these, these effects. Uh, very often, you know, previously, uh, kind of a common way to make the uh, terrain correction or the terrain effect was to use hammer tables. And the hammer tables are divided up into, uh, <clears throat> you know, these different 
different rings. We were just looking at the F ring. It has eight compartments. Um, these compartments vary from, you know, four to six to eight to twelve and, and sixteen. And the effects depend on the average elevation that you come up with, you know, a topographic feature relative to your observation point. And it's expressed as a value of T, which is given in one hundredths of a milligal. So these values associated with uh, elevations in a particular sector, an average elevation between 317 and 410, for example, would contribute 0.02 one, or two hundredths of a milligal to the um, uh, predicted gravity at that location. There's also an assumption in the table of a replacement density of two grams per cubic centimeter. So taking a look at uh, kind of a sector-by-sector -sector computation, uh, one of the first things you might ask is what is the station elevation? In this area, this, this example, it turns out to be uh, 2840 feet. You can just see the 2800 foot contour there. What is the average elevation in sector one? The sectors are labeled. This is sector one. This is a 2,600 foot contour. The average elevation might be 2,640, let's say. So we're just kind of looking at the contour line and saying, okay, that divides this sector basically up into half above, half below. And then what's the relative difference in station elevation with the average elevation in sector one? That would be 200 feet. Then we go over to the hammer table. <clears throat> we say we're between 189 and 224 feet. So that gives us a T for the topography. Remember these are in hundreds of a milligal of 0.03 milligals. So the next time we'll go through the calculations for all eight sectors in the F zone. Um, just remember that T is in hundreds of a milligal when you look at these tables. And um, um, they're calculated assuming a replacement density of two grams per cubic centimeter. We came up with a value of 0.03 milligals for that one sector. But remember, we have all those different rings. We have you know, several sectors in each ring. So we have to keep track of the acceleration associated with an individual sector, add them all up. Uh, add the influence of all rings up in order to get the total topographic uh, effect for all the rings that you think are important. So we'll fill out a table that looks um, looks like this and that's we've got average elevation, we've got the relative difference, we have the T from the uh, hammer tables, and then we have the T we can also calculate um, directly from the uh, formula that we developed for the ring. And we can get a little bit more precise value here. So we'll actually make some comparisons and um, see how the estimates from the hammer tables compare to those from an individual, uh, from our calculation, we'll use an Excel file to do that. And then we'll also correct for a density. Um, let's say we had a density of 2.7 grams per cubic centimeter, not 2 grams per cubic centimeter. So in a lot of areas, the uh, bedrock might have a average density of about 2.67 grams per cubic centimeter. How would you do that? Well, it just requires that you uh, multiply the result obtained assuming 2 grams per cubic centimeter by the ratio 2.67 over 2 or 1.34. So we'll talk more about this uh, more about this next time. Thanks for joining us. Bye.